Well, let me just repeat that it is an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I am um, very uh, pleased to be here uh, to celebrate the Constitution, and I know that that's why you're here, besides the fact that I believe it's mandatory for the, uh, uh, the scholars, uh, but not so for some of the more senior members of the um, audience. And it's very, very gratifying to see the public that is also here and interested uh, and, of course, the students. I know that you're interested or you wouldn't be a scholar here. You wouldn't have that, uh, that privilege and that designation. So it's very nice to be here and to talk about the Constitution. And I'll start by saying that both the federal and the Ohio constitutions are remarkable documents. And I think if you've taken a look at our federal, which most people have by the time they've reached where you, uh, you are in your education, but I hope that you're familiar with the Ohio constitution as well. And you know, of course, that every state has their own constitution, and that is really an important feature to realize and to be familiar with. And I'll explain a little bit in my remarks as to why. Through them, and when I say them, I mean the state constitutions and the federal constitution, our founders breathed life into our democracy on the federal and on the state level. Our constitutions, as you know, are elastic and they are flexible, yet so strong that they have continually withstood the test of time and man in war and in peace, in economic prosperity, and in depression. And that is quite a testament to uh, the resilience of the document that we call the Constitution. Any one aspect of our Constitution could spawn a discussion that would fill volumes and has filled volumes of law reviews and uh, law review articles and books and treatises and case books, etc. And a speaker could spend hours educated and informing about the clauses and the comments to the Constitution. But don't worry, I'm not going to do that this evening. I would like to talk to you about only one very small but very significant and very important aspect of our constitutional law, a one that is very near and dear to my heart because it's how I make my living, and that's appellate review. And this is just essential when we talk about our separation of powers and our balances in the government. 200 years ago, two Ohio justices nearly escaped impeachment by the Ohio General Assembly after the courts declared that the judiciary the judges had authority to rule on the constitutionality of legislative acts and executive acts. Now, we take that for granted today because we all understand the separation of power and how it is uh, carried out. But back in 1806 and 1807, that was a brand new concept for the citizens of Ohio. A majority voted for impeachment, the majority of the General Assembly, but fell just one vote short of, those, of the votes necessary to impeach those judges. It is the only time in Ohio history that justices faced a, faced a vote of impeachment. And I certainly hope for my sake and the sake of my colleagues, that's the only time that we have that as well. Now here's a little bit of the background for you. Most of you know that the Ohio Supreme Court has seven members, one chief justice, and six justices. But that composition was not the original composition of the court. In fact, we've only had this number of seven for about 100 years. Back in 1912, when there was the constitutional, uh, thanks to the amendment that was passed in 1912, um, we have seven justices. When Ohio was carved out from the Northwest Territory, <laughs> the number of members of the Supreme Court varied, and it varied at different times. And at times, there were three, and then it was all the way up to six. In 1807, there were four justices on the court. On August 21st of that year, the Supreme Court of Ohio issued its opinion in a case called Rutherford versus McFadden. And that was a dispute over the grand sum of $32.50. The decision, you say, hmm, now, but $32.50 was quite a lot of money back in 1807. Uh, and it, it, it sparked this case, and this case uh, was a tremendously important case in the uh, evolution of our, our constitutional law. The decision marked the first time that a law passed by the General Assembly was declared null and void because it was in conflict with the Ohio Constitution. That decision created a political struggle that led to the impeachment trials against two judges and became the dominant issue in Ohio politics at that time. Now, under the Constitution of 1802, dispute, disputed debts of $20 or less could be decided by a justice of the peace. If you had a dispute of $20 or more, you were entitled to a jury trial. 
And you know how important the concept of a jury trial was to uh, Americans in our new country. It was, it, it was one of the most uh, pivotal and the most important. So, remember, $20 or less, you could have a justice of the peace who was not a lawyer, was not a judge, in a rather unstructured forum would preside over this and conduct a jury trial. Excuse me, it would be conduct without a jury trial. But in 1805, the General Assembly, by merely an act of the General Assembly, not an amendment to the Constitution, decided to raise that dollar amount to $50. So, if you had a dispute and it was under $50, you were not entitled to a jury trial. You had to go before that Justice of the Peace and have your case decided in that manner. In doing so, the legislature raised the threshold for trial by jury, and that did not set well with a lot of people. In declaring that the new law was unconstitutional, the Ohio Supreme Court extended the Ohio Constitution, extended to the Ohio Constitution the same authority that the United States Supreme Court had done in Marbury versus Madison, and that is the doctrine of judicial review. The decision angered members of the General Assembly who sought articles of impeachment against the judges who applied the doctrine of judicial review. Justice Calvin Pease faced three counts of impeachment, charging him with acting, and I quote, wickedly, willfully, and corruptly. <coughs> Justice George Todd, who wrote the concurring opinion in Rutherford, was the only member of the court who was still on the court at the time of the impeachment hearings, and faced one article of impeachment for inducing, and I quote here, anarchy and confusion to the government of the state of Ohio. Of the two other members of the Supreme Court who participated in the decision, Justice Huntington escaped impeachment because he was no longer on the court. He'd been elected governor. <laughs> I often wonder how well he did with the legislature during that term. The last justice, Justice Spriggs, for some unknown reason, did not, was not a part of the case, so he did not sit on the case. So Justices Pease and Todd escaped impeachment, but only by a single vote, and only after a prolonged and heated debate in the General Assembly. Despite their losses in the impeachment proceedings, though, opponents of judicial review were not finished. After the failed impeachment vote, the General Assembly once again raised the dollar amount for cases to be heard by a Justice of the Peace, increasing it to the lofty sum of $70. So if your dispute was worth $70 or less, you had to go to the Justice of the Peace, and you were not entitled to a jury of your peers to decide the case. Court critics in the General Assembly also decided to use their authority to appoint judges who would agree that the legislature would be the most dominant branch of the government. And so they filled the two vacancies on the court, the, the two vacancies that existed at the time, with, judicial, with opponents of judicial review. Interestingly, one had been the clerk of the Senate, so you know he was in good with the, with the um, uh, legislature, and the other led the impeachment prosecution to remove the two justices that we spoke of earlier. So you know that um, they were opponents of judicial review, and they were, dare I say, puppets of the legislature who were elevated to the role of the uh, Supreme Court justice. In a renewed effort to remove Justices Peace and Todd from the bench, lawmakers passed what was been labeled the sweeping resolution that called for the termination of all judges' terms because their terms were seven years. And the way that worked, that until the sweeping resolution, the practice had been to give a new seven-year term when the justices were appointed. The resolution changed that and required that if a judge was appointed at any time during the seven-year period, he, and I remind you, they were all he at that time, he had to vacate when the seven-year period was up, regardless of when the justice started their service. The bottom line worked like this. Because it had been seven years since Ohio had become a state, the measure effectively removed the two judges from office. In other words, it swept them out of, the off or out of court, out of office, and that's why they call it the sweeping um, legislation. The legislature then approved a series of measures abolishing the newly created fourth seat on the Supreme Court and elected three new members to the court. I dare say that those three members, as I said, were very much in tune with the philosophy of the legislature. The sweeping resolution was approved 27 to 18 in the House and 14 to 10 in the Senate. Indicates to me that there were members of the General Assembly who were thinking members of the General Assembly. It was not unanimous, and that was encouraging. Uh, to when I reviewed that, that it was not unanimous. So you can imagine um, the discussions that took place in the General Assembly. 
And these numbers explain why the impeachment was not successful, because they were, it was a, a divided uh, institution. This led to talk among the judges of holding court sessions despite having been removed from office. So we were going to have these renegade judges that weren't going to accept the will of the General Assembly, and they were going to be like shadow judges or you know parallel courts. Um, thank God they didn't do that um, because that would have been, um, I think, uh, you know, that would have been a, a, a tragic situation as well. So over the next few years, opponents of judicial supremacy were defeated, leading to laws that overturned some of the mo more drastic measures that weakened the authority of the judiciary. And some observers say that any remaining friction between the two sides dissipated because the country was plunged into the War of 1812. And local politics and statewide politics somewhat paled in comparison to the united effort um, that was uh, part of the, um, the War of 1812. Now, Ohio struggled to define the role of the courts in many ways mirrors, and, um, mirrors the conflict with regards to Marbury versus Madison at the federal level, with passions, of course, running high on both sides, each accusing the other of lacking the authority to maintain the position that they were uh, advocating. Keep in mind that although today many people consider a fundamental attribute of an independent judiciary to be judicial review, which basically means that the authority of the courts to have a final say on the law and declare a statute in conflict with the Constitution, in other words, unconstitutional. The doctrine is not written expressly in the Ohio Constitution or the United States Constitution, and scholars find no evidence it was formally debated in the Constitutional Convention. It was not until 15 years after the ratification of the Constitution that Chief Justice John Marshall, in the landmark case of Marbury versus Madison, held that the Supreme Court defined the judicial power to review legislative acts in conformance with constitutional requirements. That power is an awesome, awesome power, prompting commentators to describe the United States Supreme Court as the most powerful judicial body in the world. Critically important, the power of judicial review serves as an example for other countries with newly developing constitutions to incorporate judicial review as an integral part of their judicial systems. And I can't think of a better item to export from the United States, from America, than judicial review. Although the idea of judicial review seems obvious, necessary, and inherent in our system of constitutional law, as you can see, it was not always so. Prior to Marbury versus Madison, there was as much debate about it as evidenced in the Federalist Papers and the Virginia Ratification Convention. A reading of the Federalist Papers leaves no doubt that Alexander Hamilton believed strongly that it was the judicial branch of government that must resolve conflicts between the acts of the legislature and our executive branch and the Constitution. Hamilton stated that the judiciary will always be, quote, the least dangerous of the political institutions because it had the least capacity to do violence to the rights which are guaranteed by the Constitution. He saw the courts as an intermediate body between the people and the legislature, and one that would keep the legislature within the limits that the people assigned to it. But the courts have always been deferential to the legislature, as evidenced by the presumption that laws enacted by the legislature are presumed to be, to be constitutional. Essentially, what that means is that a party challenging the constitutionality of a law has the burden of proving that it is unconstitutional by showing that the challenge statute uncontrovertibly conflicts with the Constitution. If there is a doubt as to the statute's constitutionality, it's presumed constitutional. Interestingly, the presumption of constitutionality also dates back to Marbury versus Madison in which Chief Justice Marshall was forced to distinguish the principle when the court first recognized judicial review. As early as 1788, Alexander Hamilton proposed in the Federalist Papers that judges of the new national government would have the ability to strike down laws as unconstitutional only in those cases where irreconcilable variances existed between the statute and the Constitution. In Ohio, our Supreme Court follows the United States Supreme Court and other jurisdictions in embracing the presumption of constitutionality as a limit on judicial review. We cannot strike down a statute and label it unconstitutional merely because a majority of the justices would have not 
pass that statute or believe that it's not a wise policy to be contained in that statute. Perhaps recognizing the conflict between the nascent power of the judiciary and its attenuated position from the people, the principle served as a reminder for courts that their authority to review statutes was tempered by the inherent power of our legislature. We first recognized the presumption of, in Ohio in 1852, and the case was Cincinnati, Wilmington, and Zanesville Railroad Company versus the commissioners of Clinton <coughs> County, asked us to consider the constitutionality of a law passed by the General Assembly authorizing Clinton County to subscribe to the common stock of the railroad. In short, the holding of the case illustrated the understanding that despite judicial review, the legislature remained a co-equal branch of government. The court reasoned that the legislature served in the first instance as the judge of its own constitutional powers. Like judges, legislatures took an oath to support and uphold the Constitution, and therefore they have the duty to pass constitutional laws. Because of this duty, the Ohio Supreme Court determined that courts must assume that the legislature was clearly convinced of its power to pass the law before doing so. Thus, if a court were to strike down the law while entertaining doubts about its constitutionality, it presented the absurdity of one branch of government overturning in doubt what another branch of government was clearly convinced it had the power to do, the power to pass. Having seized on the doctrine, the court employed it with some regularity in deciding cases over the next decade. But within the next decades, the presumption gained critics. Despite those critics, the presumption remained in use through the turn of the century, though less regularly. In 1942, the Ohio Supreme Court officially began referring to the presumption as the presumption of constitutionality. And soon thereafter, the presumption returned to judicial favor. Today, the presumption exists largely unchanged from when we described it in the Clinton County case having been referenced or relied on in Ohio in more than 500 cases, from criminal statutes to elections laws and from workers' compensation, workers compensation to municipal home rule issues. Of course, the presumption is not without critics who believe that the presumption is antiquated and should be abolished. Many of these critics question the ability of legislators to properly consider the constitutionality of laws they pass noting that many legislators are not lawyers and are poorly trained to evaluate the laws they pass. I don't know that that is a valid criticism. And other critics note that the tension between the legislature and the judicial branches of government. They argue that the legislative members may purposely ignore constitutional restrictions in order to expand their own powers. Thus, the presumption limits the judiciary's ability to serve as a check on such power grabbing. Now, despite these critics, the presumption is an important part of our history and a crucial check on judicial power. In essence, it reflects the very, very fabric of our democracy. Checks and balances must exist, but when one body evaluates the acts of another, it must do so with the utmost respect for the individual constitutional authority. That, of course, leads to another important doctrine, and that's the doctrine of separation of power. But I can't spend too much time on the separation of power. I won't get through this part of, of my remarks. The presumption of constitutionality is an important part of and an important check on judicial review, and it requires the courts to be highly deferential to the legislative prerogative, which reflects the will of the people. Thus, courts should rarely strike statutes on constitutional grounds, and that's certainly the case in Ohio. If there is another way to resolve the case without reaching the constitutional question, the Supreme Court will opt for that other way. When the Ohio Supreme Court does strike statutes as unconstitutional, it uses care not to invalidate more of the law than is necessary to protect the Constitution. The first reported case where the court struck a statute as unconstitutional in part provides a good example. In the Exchange Bank of Columbus versus Hines, which was decided in 1853, the court held that a section of the state tax law was unconstitutional because it exempted certain individuals from paying taxes when the Constitution did not allow for such an exemption. This provision was but one of many sections of the tax law that was passed, and it was the only one that conflicted with the Constitution. Rather than striking the entire uh, enactment, the court simply severed the unconstitutional portion, leaving the remainder of the legislators' work intact. 
By employing such a narrow focus, the court is able to enforce the Constitution without <coughs> impairing the government's ability to function efficiently. More recent examples occurred in the criminal context as exemplified in our decision in 2006, State versus Foster. There, we the court reviewed a complicated matrix of felony, felony sentencing statutes enacted 10 years earlier by the General Assembly. And all this, although this system is difficult to describe in brief, basically what it says is that there were mandatory minimum sentences that could be increased if the judge found certain factors to have existed. The court determined that such judicial fact-finding violated the Sixth Amendment's right the Sixth Amendment right to have all facts determined by a jury. And it was then left a choice to invalidate the entire statute in, uh, or to sever the offending sections. The court chose the latter and removed all references to judicial fact-finding processes from the statutes. So in order, to, there was no longer the ability to make a finding of fact by the judge without the, the aid of the jury, and the judge then increase or impose a higher sentence based on that. What resulted, though, was a system where there were no mandatory minimum sentences, and judges had full discretion to impose any sentence within the statutory range, which, quite frankly, was not the result that the uh, uh, appellants, that the proponents of striking the statute was advocating for. They thought that the whole, uh, the whole statute would be, what they wanted was the whole statute set aside, but when the court carved out the exceptions and left intact um, the portions that allowed the judges to sentence without having to justify, in essence, what their sentences were, um, it was truly an example of be careful what you ask for, because they did not get what they asked for, and that statute remains as is. Uh, the uh, legislature has never changed it once we struck the parts as being unconstitutional. Uh, it wasn't what the legislature expected, and as I said, it was not what the advocates expected, but it was necessary to protect the Constitution and ensure that Ohio retained a way to impose sentences on felony offenders. Uh, if I remember correctly, what was being advocated is that uh, all felony offenders would only be eligible to receive the absolute minimum <coughs> sentence. Uh, and, uh, of course, that did not uh, pass scrutiny with the court, uh, and judges uh, were able to then, as I said, impose sentences within the range that had been provided by the legislature. Um, the United States Supreme Court provided additional guidance in its decisions, and, of course, the, econo the economy collapsed and legislatures began to rethink whether maximum cons consecutive sentence were always worth the taxpayer dollars. We are still sorting through those answers, so I cannot speak freely about it, but that is, in essence, what guides the legislature when they're talking about sentencing decisions. You know, it, at one point the legislature was very, very um, keen on um, having what they called um, very strict uh, sentences and some pretty high uh, mandatory uh, sentences that had to be imposed depending on the behavior of the defendant and what was found. Um, in the reality, as I said, of um, uh, dwindling resources, uh, they rethink whether we want to actually retain uh, so many people in our prisons uh, given the circumstances and given the level of crimes that they have been uh, convicted of. It's an ongoing debate. It will continue to be an ongoing debate. Um, I'm going to offer an example of a civil case that talks about um, uh, constitutionality. And it is a case that began, in essence, in 2005 when the United States Supreme Court uh, issued an opinion in the Kelo case. And some of you may be familiar with the Kelo case. It was a controversial case in which the, um, it's a property rights case, a real property rights case. And uh, there was uh, the, the opinion of the Kelo case. And in Kelo, the court, the United States Supreme Court, held that the government acted under the takings uh, clause of the Fifth Amendment in, to use eminent domain, and I'm presuming you know what eminent domain is, and that's when a government takes a real estate from uh, a private owner. It could seize an individual's private property under its eminent domain powers not only for roads, schools, and courthouses, you know, for public purpose, but for private developers who would purportedly increase economic and job development by building things like malls, office complexes, and the like. And these type of buildings bring a much higher tax base than small homes, 
And that's what the justification was. And the United States Supreme Court said in Kelo, which is a case that came out of Con uh, Connecticut, <coughs> that yes, the local uh, um, uh, government entity can take that property, they can turn it over to a developer, the developer can develop it, and it's going to be good for the entire community, and that is constitutional. And uh, you can imagine the uproar around the country when this case came out. Significantly, the United States Supreme Court said, we're deciding this based on you know, the, um, the Constitution uh, and our body of law, but that the individual states, and they almost invited the individual states to make their own decisions when it comes to whether or not a, an entity can seize property uh, and use the help of the local government to do that and use eminent, the tool of eminent domain. Um, so uh, we in Ohio took them up on their invitation to uh, uh, decide the case for uh, Ohio. And that case was Norwood versus Horney, which was a 2006 case. And we agreed to hear an appeal from a Hamilton County uh, appellate uh, court, which had authorized, the appellate court, court authorized the use of eminent domain to take an entire neighborhood for a development uh, similar to what had happened in Kelo. And after we took the case, the General Assembly imposed a moratorium on such takings and ultimately passed that law into effect. But while that moratorium was in effect, um, we had this case in front of us, and we felt compelled to clarify the principles of the Ohio Constitution that governed the use of eminent domain in our state. So in 2006, in the first decision by this, it was the first decision that was issued by a state Supreme Court relying on a state constitution and dealing with the exact same issue that Kelo uh, presented when um, it was presented before the United States Supreme Court. And we held that the Ohio Constitution forbade such taking if they were purely for economic development. So it was 180 from what happened uh, with the United States Supreme Court. And we instructed the courts to apply strict scrutiny, the most rigorous type of review, to such takings because the Ohio Constitution conferred on Ohio citizens a fundamental right to acquire, own, and use private property. That holding was the one that garnered headlines not only here in Ohio, but across the country from Orange County, California, to North Carolina, to New York, uh, Florida, all across the country. The um, uh, editorials as well as articles were written about this case in Ohio and how we had championed property rights of the individual in the face of government eminent domain activities. Of course, uh, in other cases, um, you know, here we are championed in, in some newspapers, and in other cases it's not unusual for uh, the court to be excoriated for our ignorance, <laughs> you know. Uh, so some days are, are good, the newspapers are good to the courts, and, and some days they're not. But our decision in, Ke uh, in uh, Norwood also clarified the law uh, in at least two ways that are significant in the constitutional sense. First, we use the void for vagueness doctrine to strike down the Cincinnati zoning ordinance that defined blight. Uh, and the way that that legislation was written and the way that legislation, the Cincinnati legislation, was applied to this case was unconstitutional because it was vague. It did not give the property owners fair notice that their property was at risk for taking. This property was not blighted property, it was not condemned property, it was reviewed and decided that it was in danger of being blighted in the future, but it wasn't at the time. So it was the first time that that analysis had been used in this manner. And second, we found that the statute enacted by the General Assembly, which was Revised Code 163, violated the separation of powers doctrine. And that was a kind of a, a really interesting twist on this case because what the law says is in eminent domain cases in which the government won at the trial level, the statute provided that if the property owner appealed that decision to the appellate court, but the government paid or deposited the amount of money the trial court determined to be just compensation for that piece of property, for the taking of the property, the courts were forbidden from issuing injunctions or other orders to stop the taking. So what it meant is if I want to take your, uh, if I'm the government and I want to take your piece of property, um, you can object to that, and you can go through the courts, 
And the way you will be compensated when it's all over and done with is that I, as the government, has set aside a pot of money that I deem is fair compensation for your home. I'm going to come in and, and take your property, and we will continue with our project. And, you know, rest assured that sometimes the dissent is so persuasive that it draws the approval of justices who originally voted the exact opposite and they rethink it and then that dissenting opinion becomes the majority opinion and oftentimes that will what we call flip a case and then the author of the dissenting opinion becomes the author of what is now a majority opinion and that happens um, um, I'm not going to say that it happens frequently, but it does happen, and uh, it's always, you know, kind of a, a special um, sense of satisfaction when you've written a dissent and you're able to convince your colleagues that, see, you, you thought about it this way, and then you, you wrote such a persuasive dissent that you were able to get them to come over to your way of thinking about it, which you are convinced, of course, is the absolute right way to do it, decide the case, and um, that's the way the resolution turns out to be. So. Uh, you know, how many are 4 3, 5 2, 6 1, 7 0? Oh, I don't have those stats. Can I follow up? Sure. Could you give us an example of a, of a recent case? You, you've, you've given us examples of cases where you were, were very proud of the result of the court. Could you give an example of a, of a decision where you, where, that you thought should have gone the other way? Well, interestingly, I am probably in the majority more times than. Uh, other justices. I mean, I, I vote with the majority. Uh, I'm a very kind of middle of the road justice. Um, there's plenty of times that I'm the, you know, have done what I just described as flipped cases. And um, but um, so I'll tell you what's difficult. And I can't really pinpoint a case uh, to use as an illustration. But there are often cases that we have to make a decision on, and we hate the fact that the case came out the way it did because we don't agree with those statutes. We don't agree with the policy that's contained in the statute. We find it to be a misapplication to the facts that come before the court. In other words, it was probably a situation where the legislature never envisioned that this statute would have to be used in this way, and yet the wording of the statute doesn't give us any room to interpret it in a way that would allow for um, a, a different result. So we have to write the case. You have to identify the law and identify the precedent, and you can put in a, the uh, opinion, or a concurring justice can put in an opinion that we really hope the legislature re-examines the statute, and this outcome of this case is a perfect example of why that needs to happen. You can make this the last question. Okay. Going to the federal and the Supreme Court, do you believe the long care decision was uh, constitutionally legal? Same answer as I gave the gentleman Sam over there. I can't talk about it. Okay, that's such a short one. We'll go with one that left back there. <laughs> Provided it's a short one too. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, first off, really quick, um, about the election, you're talking about re-election of justices. Does that happen continuously until they reach that point where they're? Totally yeah, our terms are six years. Yeah. We're staggered. Right now, there's three justices that... And you can be re-elected, correct? Yes. Okay. There's no term limits, only age limit. Okay. So, and right now, there's, I mean, there's staggered. There's three justices that are up this year. Um, two years will be two, then three, so... Okay. So, here's my question. It's dealing with judicial review. Um, what do you... How should I phrase this? Okay. With, in dealing with judicial review, since you're popularly elected, I'm wondering what dealing does that fact that you can you have the ability of judicial review how is that affected by the fact that you're popularly elected do you think we have a constituency is that what your well, question I, I is do we I, respond to a constituency yeah i guess especially how have you thought the idea that well I'm, i don't want to make the popular decision i want to make what's correct like constitutionally in dealing with judicial review how how have you been able to do that um well I, i'll give you an example that you know just came out the other day is that um the ballot language for issue two was brought to the court for our review. Um, and we said it didn't pass muster. It has to go back to the ballot board, and they have to um, reword the ballot language. And 
Uh, that was a 6-1 decision. Uh, that we're, you know, I, I say this, and I don't mean to label our court one party or the other, but the majority of the justices on the court are Republicans, okay? And the people that wrote the ballot language are Republicans, you know, for the most part. And so there were people who actually said, what's wrong with the Supreme Court? They just handed down an opinion that is against the interest of the Republican-held legislature. And, you know, to that we have to say, so what? We can't let that guide us. Can you imagine how frustrating that would be if you had an oath of office that you, you know, you, if you interpret your oath of office to incorporate political considerations, uh, uh, public policy considerations, uh, popular <coughs> vote uh, you know, considerations, you'd be stymied. You could never do your job. It's so much easier to have the freedom to know I'm doing my job, I'm upholding my oath of office, and if the public doesn't like it, or the political party doesn't like it, or the governor doesn't like it, or the attorney general, or, you know, whomever, there's nothing I can do about that other than to hopefully craft a decision that explains why we arrived at the decision we arrived at, interpreted the law the way we interpreted it, and came to the only conclusion that we believe is legally defensible given our statutes and our Constitution. And if that means that the next time I run I'm going to be unelected, um, then so be it. I can't worry about I can't worry about that, and I don't think that uh, you could do your job if you were worried about whether or not you're going to please or displease this person, that person, this interest group, or that interest group. Thank you. Oh. With that, I guess we're in. We're done. Thank you. Thank you.